you have a Bible, I want to invite you today to open it to 1 Samuel chapter 17. That's what we'll be looking at today and, and studying into. If you are new today or maybe just coming back to church or maybe haven't been to church in a long while, uh, it is an honor to be with you today. I'm glad you're here. Uh, and I believe God wants to say something to your life today. And, and I appreciate you giving me the chance to speak. Um, we uh, have been here a couple years and I want to say thank you to, to Healing Place because you guys have been such an encouragement and a resource of ideas and support uh, for our church. And uh, we just planted a brand new church in Southern California. Uh, yeah, amen, in September. So we're five month old, little baby church, you know. And so I brought one of the guys on our team here with me, uh, Dom, he's down there, Dom. Go ahead and stand and just show everybody who you are. Good looking young man. He's 21 and single ladies. So you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying, I ain't saying, but I'm saying. Sorry, dude, I, I told you I wouldn't, but I lied. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, we are just so excited about what God's doing in our church. And I did want, if you haven't, you know, met me or maybe you've, you've come to Healing Place in the last year or maybe you're watching at the Denham campus and, and you're new to Healing Place, uh, I just want you to kind of get to meet the best parts of me real quick. I got a few pictures of my family. This is my beautiful wife, Brenda. Um, Brenda proves that a prayer life will work for you. And... Um, Come on, let's, I tell y'all this all the time, but Brenda, she's amazing. So she pledged this year, she's, at a, um, she's, she's got our daughter and had some things, but next year she's gonna be with me. God bless you. And, um, and this is our daughter, Eliana. This is, um, that's, that's Eliana Joy, and she is the joy of her daddy's heart. Um, and I wanted you to see day one of the church we planted in Southern California. This church wouldn't have happened without your prayers and support. That was day one. Come on, bless God for that. We, uh, we've seen incredible uh, moves of God and, and outpouring of his spirit. We've seen lives change. We, uh, we did our very first baptism last week and we had uh, 14 people get baptized. This young man was one of them. As you can see, that's his dad in the background, just so proud. Uh, and mom's there taking pictures too. And then I wanted to show you a picture of, of, a, of, a, um, of a younger couple, um, amen, right? Um, and, but this, this, this picture is special to me. Uh, they came to our city church just about a month ago for the first time and they caught me afterwards. And that was me saying, you have blessed my heart so big. And here's why. They had not been to church in 50 years and they came to our city church and they gave their life to Christ. Come on, Healing Place. We believe in a God that it's never too late. No matter how long it's been, how long you've been praying for your parents, your kids, your children, your grandkids, don't ever quit. Don't believe that it's just going to stay bad. 50 years away from God in church and the humble still came and moved in the heart of them. And I bless God for it. I want to pray today over today's message. I, I am... I am so excited to share what God's laying on my heart today. Um, I don't know where you're at today, but I believe that, that there is something that's gonna happen in this service and in this church today, that, that those of you who have been praying for breakthrough, you've been praying for deliverance, you've been praying for something to just push you past that wall of resistance. It doesn't matter if it's in your marriage, it doesn't matter if it's with your kids, in your finances, maybe it's something that you are struggling with personally, but I do believe that the word God's given um, um, for today, for this house, is a word that will that will introduce breakthrough in some areas of your life, and and so I'm excited to, to share it with you. Would you join me in a word of prayer today as we ask God to share and speak to us through His Word? God, I thank you, and I come before you, and I ask today that you would speak directly to your people. Uh, I ask that you would use this word, God, to, to go into the nooks and the crannies, Lord, the parts of us that, that sometimes we forget are there or we don't even know are there, and that you would minister your word in its power, in its, in its, in its grace, its love, and its redemption. Open our eyes today. Illuminate something in a story some of us have read hundreds of times that we've never seen before. And I ask God that you would equip Healing Place Church for the rest of 2019. Prepare them, God, as we move towards Easter, God, as we have a community that's going to hear about Jesus for the first time here in a short few months. Um, God, I ask that you would equip and prepare us, God, to be ready to receive what you're going to send our way this year at Healing Place Church. God, I bless this message. I bless our Denim campus, and I ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. And if you believe and receive that, would you say amen? Amen, amen, amen. amen. Um, 
I want to talk to you today about a story that most of you have either read or heard referenced in culture. Um, and some of you have, you know, you know about it. In fact, you don't even have to be a Bible reader and you already will know what exactly this, the rest of the title of this story is about. It's a very famous story. We hear about it in sports. And if I said it, you, you call it back to me, finish this sentence, David and Goliath, right? Like, you know the story. You kind of know how it goes. If you've been in church a while, you know what goes on. And, 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 and so anytime as a preacher that you feel that God is moving you to preach something that people already have in their minds, in their hearts, people know it, they know how it goes, you run the risk of people tuning out or, or you know, not really paying attention because kind of like, I already know how it goes. You know, it's David versus Goliath, right? We hear it. March Madness is happening. They're going to talk about these Cinderella teams that don't, you know, can't beat the big teams. And all of a sudden, these small teams teams beat the big team and they say oh we got a classic David versus Goliath battle going on today and it's it's the way that it's done right and 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 today I want to talk about it but this is what I want to ask you to do especially if you've been in church a while I want you to pretend you don't know anything about how the story of David and Goliath goes just for today, I need you to remove from your mind, everybody watching at Danham campus, I need you to just wipe it off. Like you do not know David versus Goliath. The only thing you know is what you're gonna hear or you're gonna read. And I want you to do what you can to just take it as if you were reading it or hearing about it for the first time. Because I do believe there's a few things that God wants to shine new to you and to your life and to your church that, that, that he has in this story. This story is one of my favorite stories in all of the Bible. It's a life story. God brings me back to it about once a year. I told our church, every year I will preach on David and Goliath because every year God has something to share because we're always fighting Goliaths. We're always fighting giants. We're always facing things that are bigger than us. Some of you know what that's like. Right now you are facing something bigger than you. It's tough, it's difficult, it's not easy. Whatever it is that you're in and you're battling it and it sometimes feels like a lonely battle and I wanna get into the battle, we're gonna go to it but before we do, I think it's imperative, important, crucial that we look at who this boy named David is. Where's he's coming from? And so for that, I'd like you to help me with that. Everybody say there and then. There. Come on, y'all say it real loud, there and then. Everywhere I preach, every single Sunday I preach for our church, I always preach from the perspective I call there and then. It's just my way of saying, I want you to understand the world that the Bible was written in. I want you to understand the context, the world of the Bible, because I believe firmly, if you don't know the world of the Bible, you can't understand the word of the Bible. And I want you to know the word of God. I want you to understand the word of God. I want you to apply the word of God. I believe in the word of God. It's the principle, it's the foundation of my life. It's what brings me home when I get wandering. It's what keeps me inspired when I need to be lifted. It encourages me, it challenges me, it rebukes me. All of these things is what God's word does, but I need to know what's going on. So there and then, here's what's happening. We have a boy, he's, he's a shepherd boy, because he's not of able age to be involved in a battle, he is, he is doing what his job and task has been given by his family. Now, there and then, there was every, uh, every able-bodied and aged appropriate man was in the battle, okay? So they're away, and they're fighting against this, this, this enemy of this country named Israel. It's God's people, and if you're new to the Bible, whenever we say God's people or the Israelites or the Hebrews or, or the people of God or the children of Israel, like this is always saying Israelites, God's people, the Hebrews, it's all the same thing in, when we're referring to this in the Old Testament. So God's people is at a battle. Now the way they used to do it is that they would take two kings of the two armies that were battling and they would fight, or the two best warriors. The king was supposed to go out, but he could always appoint one person. And so they've got this guy named Goliath, and that's where all the people who are fighting are. Now, I wanna get to that, but I want you to now zoom in because I firmly believe that there are some things that God wants to break through in your life and he wants you to be able to conquer and to move beyond. He wants you to be infused with the power of God to be able to, to, to fight against and to stand up against the thing that has been telling you to sit down, that you're invisible, that you'll never do it, you'll always be like that, it will always be like this, it'll never change. And I wanna take all of those lies and I wanna be able to just go after them together today. I wanna read this story and open it up and I just want you to listen to it. This is what it says, verse 17. Now, Jesse said to his son David, 
Take this ephah of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are um, and, and bring back some assurance from them. Verse 19, they are with King Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of law fighting against the Philistines. Okay, I, I'm gonna read it again, but this is what I want you to do. If you're willing to do it, will you close your eyes? And I don't want you to do anything except imagine and picture what I read. And I'm gonna ask you to give me some feedback on what it is that you hear, feel, sense, and understand about the characters in this. Pretend you don't know who he is. Pretend you don't know anything. You know, you didn't go to Sunday school. You don't understand this. And just listen to what the Bible writer records as what is being described about David. I'm going to read it again. Listen. Now, Jesse said to his son David, take this F of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance for them. They are with King Saul and all the men of Israel in the Valley of Allah fighting against the Philistines. Open your eyes. Just real quick, church. Just say it out loud at the Denham campus real quick. Describe David as you just heard to me, only as you just heard. Ready, go. Servant, somebody else. He's a boy. Good. Someone else. Delivery boy. boy. That's perfect. Yes, a delivery boy. He's he's handing out pizza. (laughs) David, as we meet him, is a water boy. Nothing about what you hear when, when, when the Bible opens up this famous story about David and Goliath describes a champion Come on, y'all. Let me talk to the fellas real quick. Everybody watching online, Dan, I'm right here. Listen, listen, listen. You mean to tell me that when you were in high school, you would have loved to go to high school football practice with the varsity team, and that you would have been loved to be the one that rolled out into the middle of practice, and they had a break, and all the players are there, and you came out walking out, and you had some bread, some grain, and a bunch of cheese. Hey, guys. I got a good spread of cheese here. I'm telling you right now, this stuff's amazing. Nobody wants that job. Nobody wants to be that. You want to be the champion. Whenever we hear this story, the tendency for us is to always look at the Bible with characters' understanding of what we learn about them. But it's hard to sometimes slow down, pump the brakes, and say, wait a minute. Nobody says that David is amazing. He's not impressive. He's not encouraging. And he shows up and he's sent out as a messenger boy. He's just the boy. And furthermore, here's the, what else I want you to know, is that he's still in and around the area of Jerusalem and the town and the, and, and the place where Israel's people were. Now, I got a question for you. Whoever would win against this battle, the other army would take over that country and they would become the slaves. So this is a really important battle that's going on. Here's, here's my question. If all of the able aged men who can fight in an army or at a battle, who's watching Jerusalem? Who's left in Jerusalem? Women, children, the elderly. It's a vulnerable time. They used to have to put walls up to protect people from coming in and taking over. Can you imagine being a mom trying to put your kids to bed at night and they're saying, mommy, when's daddy coming home? How come daddy ain't here? When's daddy coming home? And you as a mom have to try to encourage your child, honey, daddy's, daddy's out fighting with, 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 his, with his brothers and he's, he's fighting for the things of God and, and we believe he's gonna come home soon, honey. It's gonna be okay. She puts her kids down. She walks into the room and she, she has an honest mom moment with God where she could be herself without her kids seeing it and say, God, what, is he okay? Is he coming back? I've been telling these kids that for six weeks. It's not like you can call them, text them, check it. No, you don't know if they're okay. You don't know if Goliath already won. You don't know what's going on. You just know you're vulnerable. See, this battle is not just about David versus Goliath. It's about a whole entire city's vulnerability. It's about a family feeling like it's gonna work out. It's about children being taught that God overcomes. There's so much going on that you and I are going through even today. And this is what's encouraging for us is what happens next. What, what we hear that is, happens next is, is incredible. Verse 22 says this, David left his things. He went out there, he took the bread, the cheese. He's, he's you know just the messenger boy, water boy. And he says, it says that David left his things with the keeper of the supplies. He 
ran to the battle lines and greeted his brothers. Verse 23, as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion uh, from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. Ooh, I love God's word sometimes. Watch this, church. It says that Goliath is the enemy of God's people, and he steps out from the battle lines, and he starts talking his normal nonsense. He shouts his usual defiance. Here's what's crazy is that God's people had gotten so used to the sound of the enemy's taunts that they were just standing in fear doing nothing. And the Bible includes this small little detail that I love. It says, he gets out and says what he always says. You ain't nothing, you'll never be nothing. You know what, this is what you've done wrong. I'm gonna just shame you and guilt you and weigh you down with burdens. I'm gonna keep you down full of doubt and depression and worthless thoughts. I'm gonna just beat you up and just make you feel just like God's against you and I'm gonna get you. And that's exactly what he would do and they were afraid of him. They would hide from him in fear, the Bible tells us. And it says something really powerful is that he got up and said the same stuff the enemy has always been saying, only this time it was different because this time David heard it. Mm. I don't know where y'all at today, but I'm here to talk to a few of the Davids sitting in a room today. That the enemy has been talking to your kids, has been talking to your husband, has been talking to your wife, has been talking to your grandkids, has been saying the usual stuff that the enemy is always saying and taunting and yelling and speaking. It just is, is going on and on and on. And then all of a sudden, when you catch wind of it, though, you go, wait a minute, what? No, 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 no. We don't do it like that here. I don't stand for that. We ain't gonna speak it over my kids. We ain't going to talk like that. I don't receive that message. I'm here to stand up against that usual stuff y'all used to listening to. You have value. You have purpose. God has called you. And you begin to prepare yourself to go into battle by talking about what your God has done for you and what you believe he's going to do right here. I just want to tell you all right now that I preach better the louder you are. So at any point in time today, Denim, I know we're new. We're getting to know each other today, okay? So I just want to let y'all know. If at any point in time, y'all don't like this message, it's your fault. <laughs> I, it's, that's on you. I'm doing my best. So feel free to step on in. Bible tells us that David gets out there, and this is, this is powerful. Watch what happens. <laughs> you, some of y'all are going to really feel this one. Verse 28, it says, When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here, little brother? And with whom did you leave those few little sheep in the desert, little shepherd boy? Few little sheep, just few little sheep, what do you mean, few little sheep? You ever have somebody in your family try to talk down to you because you're achieving things and working at things and going to school and getting your education and working on your debt and working on your marriage and going to counseling and getting in the life group and going to the serve day and being a part of church and you trying to do something for you and God and all of a sudden your family don't really want to change, don't really want to get right, wants to stay in fear and have the enemy beat them up. And so instead of being honest about what they want to do, it's just easier to pick on the things you're trying to do for God. Who am I talking to today? Am I talking to anybody in this church? See, David and Goliath is about so much more than him just beating up on a giant. No, 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 no. He, before he faced the giant on the outside, David had to face giants on the inside. David has family issues. He had brothers and sisters. He had moms and dads. He had kings that didn't see who he was on the inside, and he didn't lose his stuff. He said, you know what the problem around here is? Y'all ain't fighting anyways out here talking like you out here fighting. What you doing? Y'all ain't doing nothing. Y'all standing around here acting like you something. You ain't nothing. Bunch of punks. <laughs> right? Hey, 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 hey. I'm just talking real right now. That's, that's the flesh. That my grandma used to say, that's the flesh coming up in you. Right? But that humanity, that brokenness, that way of being, it wants to raise up. But what we see is the spirit of God was alive and well in the heart of David. He didn't project that ugly humanity. He projected the humility of God. He just said, you know what? I've been fighting the little giants of pride. 
I don't need to defend myself. I don't need to prove you wrong. I don't need to make sure you know where I'm going. I don't need to make sure you understand. You know what, brother? I'm not trying to get into this with you. Some of y'all need to take that approach with your sister and with your brother and with your mom and your dad. Because you keep sending emails thinking they're going to come to church because you keep telling them how they're living in sin. It ain't working. Change your approach. Because my question to you would be, how's your approach working for you? It ain't working. It don't. You know what you got to do? You got to learn to do what David does, which is, I'm not going to tell you all about you, even though you're trying to clown me. You're trying to disrespect me in front of all the people, too. In front of everybody. He says, where's your little sheep, David? Little brother. What you out here doing anyways? Man, go home. Get up out of here. And he don't, give, he don't fight back with that. He goes, to fight this would be to fight the little giants. I'm here to fight big giants. See, you want to have little arguments pretending you fighting big stuff. You know what? That's what small people do. When you're small on the inside, you fight small things and pretend you're killing big giants. But everybody knows you ain't doing nothing. You're sitting there having small arguments, making big deals out of small things. And while you're doing that, there's big giants tormenting you and your family that you can't say nothing to because you're too caught up fighting small, insignificant, little, inconspicuous arguments. Come on, somebody. I love what he says, how David responds. He goes uh, and he tells him, look, man, I'm not going to get into this. He stays on the big prize. See, God has David called and David knows he's there for something bigger. He don't know what it is. He don't know why it is. But he's just there. I'm a servant. I'm handing out grain, bread, and some cheese if I have to. And then all of a sudden, he's just trying to be a good servant. He's just serving God. He just loved them sheep. He just loved his God. And all of a sudden, he's out there trying to do what God has him to do. And I'm, what, what, the, what, is, what is he saying? What do you say? Wait, 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 wait. Y'all just used to this? Y'all just let him, y'all just let this go down? This is how you, whoa, hey, 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 hey. I'm, I'm going to tell you right now. No, no, no. Watch this, verse 32. <laughs> David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. <laughs> Sometimes you got to read the Bible like you got it. What, what's in you is in it, right? I, I think, Dave, you know, I grew up real close to Oakland in the East Bay of San Francisco, right? And I was raised in part by Texan grandparents. So if you're confused today at what you're looking at and listening to, it ain't my fault. Oakland and my Texan grandparents did it to me, okay? So that's what you get. But I'm reading into it what I heard in it, and this is what I hear. Hey, King. You ain't got to worry about this, baby. Your servant will go out there and fight him. I, I got this. I'm, don't, why, why, are we all, why are we all worrying and tripping? No, no, no. We don't have to, we don't have to do all this. This is too much. Let's, let's spend our energy on other things, not this. We got this. And then King Saul, in, in the humanity, in the flesh, responds in the flesh. He responds with what he sees physically. He speaks about the problem. Watch this. Remember, we got two kings we're watching. We're watching two kings. If you're not a Bible reader, the current king is Saul, but the future king is David. Mm, 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 mm. And David says, let no one lose, account, lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go out and fight him. Verse 33, the the future former king says, uh, you are not able to go and fight this Philistine. You can't do that. You are only a boy, and he's been fighting since his youth. Mm -hmm. I'm going I got time for this. Yes, I do. I'm going to tell you right now, listen to me. I don't know who I'm talking to right now. This ain't in the notes in my heart, but I feel like I'm supposed to say it right now. There are some of you in this room right now that you have, paid, you have had people tell you, you can't do that. You don't know how to do that. Nobody knows how to do that in this family. We've never been able to do that. What you think you're going to go do? Or you're just going to go out and do that, are you? And I'm here to tell you right now that if God has put it in your heart to go do that thing, and it's God's voice and God's will and God's determination, don't let nobody, ready? Don't let nobody who's afraid to do what they're supposed to be doing keep you at the lower level so they feel like they got company doing less than what they're supposed to. Am I talking to you? Because that's what people do. 
They, they know that they're living at a lower level than what God has for them. And instead of being like, man, God, I need to grow. I need to stretch. I need to get into some word. I need to be in a church. I need to hear you speak to me. They just accept it. And then they start pulling. Where are you trying to go? Where are you trying? Don't you get up. Don't you leave me. You can't leave me. I need you to be around me because I don't want to be alone doing less than I'm supposed to. And David, he don't disrespect Saul. He don't disrespect the king. He don't say, you know what the problem is, king? You know who's supposed to be out there fighting him, right? You. What you doing? Well, who are you talking about? I'm just a boy. What are you? He don't do none of that. Listen to me. If you're a teenager in this place or watching online or, or at denim, I'm going to tell you, don't disrespect the authority above you, even if they don't see what God sees. That is not how David does it. David don't start talking down to Saul. He don't. He says, want to know how to do it? Here you go. If you want to know, how do I still honor somebody who's disrespecting me? You just a boy. You can't go out there and do that. What you thinking? What you thinking about? What you doing? Shh. You ain't got to get in. Don't fight the little giant of this argument. That's a small giant. If you got big Goliaths out there, you can go get you got to stay focused, baby. You got to look at what God has you going to. You got to stay on it. You can't get caught up beneath where you're supposed to be. That's where they are comfortable. They want you in these lower arguments. Oh, yeah, I got you mad. I keep you because this I love. To, this is my domain. I live in this. I'm comfortable in this dysfunction. And you get in it, you're going to stay in it. God is like. I'm pulling you out. I want you to come out. Grow up. Stand up. Get out. I got more for you. Don't disrespect. Don't stomp them down. Don't tell them you're worthless. Just say, hey, I'm telling you, this is what God wants you to do. This is how you do it. Watch what David said. I love this so much. But David, verse 34, but David said to King Saul, your servant. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Your servant. Mom. Mom. I'm your boy. I know you don't. I understand, Dad. I'm your daughter. I'm, I'm, I'm your son. Hey, I'm just trying to make you proud. I care about your legacy. I care about your name. And you start with that kind of honor. Do you hear that? They don't have to be acting honorable, but you start with honor because you're honorable. You don't honor the, the if you are honorable, you can give honor to people who don't deserve it. Because the honor doesn't rest on them, it rests on you and it will return to you. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. Okay? Which I would have told David, don't lead with that. You got other stuff in that story? You start with that stuff, right? Come on. Remember, tell him about the lion and the bear and stuff, right? I mean, come on. But David, he does it the right way. And when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it and I struck it and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it turned on me, I seized it by its hair. I struck it and killed it. Mm. I don't make you just stand up and shout. David proclaims what God has used him to do. You don't have to argue with someone's perspective of you. You just gotta tell them what you've been doing and what God's got you doing. You ain't gotta tell them, no, no, I am gonna do it. You just tell them what you're doing already. You know what, maybe not. I don't know if you're right or wrong, but I believe it's not true and I'm trying to honor you and I wanna honor you and here's the things God's got me doing and this is where I'm headed. And this is what it is. And this is what I'm ready to do. And this is what I believe. And, and any time this happened in my past, this is what I tried to do about it. And God delivered them sheep. And God delivered me. And this Philistine, he going to be just like them. He going down just like the rest of it. Because the future king is looking not at the size of the giant, but he looking at the size of his God. When... You look at your problems and you obsess over your problems and you worry about your problem and you talk about your problems and you even pray over and over and over and over again about your problem and you should pray and you should bring your requests and make them known to God. That's scriptural. It's appropriate. It's important. But I have found often in the church that we do an imbalance of 
talking to God and talking to our problems. And what we end up doing is we end up telling God more about our problems than we learn to tell our problems about our God. And we have to shift that. I'm not saying we don't make our requests known to him. I'm just saying when's the last time you told your problems who your God was? We've got to begin to take back that root, that history, that old legacy that the generation before us, they knew how to do that because times was tough and it was rough and they knew how to stand strong and be faithful and in full of faith and say, look, this don't feel good, it ain't right, but we're going to make sure that we believe and trust God and speak to the problem what God has done and what God can do and what we believe God is going to do. And David is full of that. So when he's done... He goes out and the king tells him, go, you know what? Go on ahead then, which is kind of funny, right? So like, you can't go out there. Well, I killed the lion and bear. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Watch this, verse 40. Then David took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones. Everybody say five. five. From the stream and put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. Mm, 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 mm. With his sling in his hand, he approaches the Philistine. Can I talk to you about the shepherd's bag for just a quick second? Listen to me now. When God begins to promote you and he begins to elevate you and he begins to bless you and you begin to step into the places where God is going to use you in mighty ways, never forget where you came from. You keep a symbol of who you are, where you've been, and you keep that shepherd's pouch right here and you put the things that God uses you, your special gifts, your special ability, the things that are amazing about you, you keep them, but you just put them in that shepherd's bag. Don't you go out and get yourself some high roller, high level stuff that's like, hey, everybody, I want you no, I made it. Yeah, okay, you showing off that you made it. But what I'd like to see every now and then is I'm not showing off that I'm showing you where I came from made it, okay? This shepherd's bag right here so you know I know who I am. I don't need to put the nicest bag on my side so you think I'm somebody. I'm somebody because this bag been with me through prayer, through trial, through struggle, through disappointment, through discouragement. This thing has been with me. This is who I am. I'm just a shepherd boy off the backside of a mountain taking care of some sheep, like to play my harp and throw some rocks. That's me. You know what I can imagine? He's walking out to meet the, the, the giant. He's going out to fight him. He reaches in and he grabs five, which if I had, you know, maybe next year we'll mess around with the five. But, you, you know, Goliath always got a couple brothers. And once you kill him, his brothers find out of him and be like, oh, you think you're just going to beat, beat the giant? And that's it. You, you better grab the five stones. Don't just grab one. Make sure you got a couple for when his brothers come looking for revenge. And you say, look, your head is as big as your brother's. So uh, I, I can throw this rock. You better watch it. But the Bible tells us something really interesting. If we go down to verse 48 that I want you to hear, David has told the, the, the giant who his God is as well. He tells him, like, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. I don't come against you with any of that. So I come against you in the name of the Lord whose armies you have defied. And this day he will hand you over to me. And not only that, I will defeat you. And then, and then David gets real, like, Oakland, man. He, he, he from where I'm from, okay? Because he goes like this. Today, God will hand you over to me, and I will kill you, and, I'll kill, and, and, and I'm going to cut off your head. I'm like, why you got to tell him you're going to cut off his head? That's extra. <laughs> you don't need to do that. And right after he tells his giant about his God, did you hear the difference? Listen to me. Some of you got a bad habit. You tell your God about your giants all the time. You should do that. It's a part of a prayer life. That's fine. But it's imbalanced if you don't sometimes tell your giant the name of your God, the accomplishments of your God, the faithfulness of your God, the resume of your God, the past things of your God. You use them, the stories that you got. You dip into the stories that are in the Bible. You talk about your grandmama's stories, your grandpa's stories, your sister's story. You talk about that one church you heard of. You know this pastor from Southern California stories. Shoot, take some of my stories and tell your giant who your
Look at your neighbor and say, tell them who God is. Look at your other neighbor and say, tell them who God is. Here we go. Verse 48. Watch this. This is it. This is it. This is it right here. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, watch what David does. David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Hey, don't wait for the enemy to get up to you. You go out and meet him. You run to it. You ain't got to be afraid. You got the spirit of God living inside of you. The same spirit that was in David and that raised Jesus from the dead is here and alive and wants to live inside of you. You don't have to wait for the enemy to get on your doorstep, to get into your marriage, to get into your kids, to get into your business, to get into your life. You can go out in front, get out in front of it and say, I'm going to meet you out there, okay? Because I'm not coming at you with a bunch of power that's from me and my sword skills. I'm, man, shoot, I'm a shepherd boy with some rocks. But I tell you this, my God is bigger, my God is greater, and I've seen him do it already, and I just would like to remind everybody that that's what we're dealing with here. It says that as he ran towards him, verse 49, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead, and the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down. I want to do it again. Verse 49, keep it up there for me if you don't mind. This is so interesting because it says that while this giant seven-foot-plus battle champion is running at him, he runs at him too. Now watch, the Bible says that while he's doing this, now I didn't run on the track team, but I'm going to give you my best. It says that he reaches into his shepherd's bag and he takes out a stone. He puts it into his slingshot. He whips around his slingshot and he slings it while he's running at the enemy. Let's do it one more time for the people in the back. The Bible says that after telling the enemy who his God was and reminding his problem how great his God was, that he ran at the giant, reached into his bag, pulled it out, slung it, and threw it at the giant. Oh, where are you at today, healing place? God is looking for some people who are willing to run at a giant who know how to reach in and grab that stone and in one motion be able to sling it at the giant. Here's my question for you today. Are you ready for the question? Do you think that's the first time David ever practiced that? Listen to me. Listen, 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 listen. Stay, stay, stay. Watch, watch, watch. Do not look down on the seemingly insignificant moments on the backside of a mountain when nobody is watching you, where you don't know why you're still fighting over these issues. All you're doing is raising these kids, folding these towels, running to the grocery store, going to work, working for this boss, dealing with this budget, struggling with these issues, dealing with these lions, dealing with these bears, and it feels so small and so insignificant and nobody sees what I'm really going through, what I'm really dealing with, what I'm really facing. In fact, all I'm doing is throwing rocks. Man, God, what you got me out here doing anyways? I feel like i am got more in me than this, and I don't even see what's the point. What is the point of this marriage? What is the point of this kid? What is the point of what this season is in my life? All I'm doing is throwing rocks. Oh, if you will stay faithful to the things God's called and commissioned you to do and nobody is watching, he will one day put you into a position where everybody is. Stay faithful. Somebody say faithful. God is looking to do a breakthrough in your life and he wants to do it through the position of your faithfulness. Faithful to the task. Faithful to the calling. Faithful to what's hard. You may not get accolades. You may not be appreciated. Nobody may even think you should be invited to the party. But I promise you this. If you stay humble, you honor those in front of you, and you stay committed to working on your craft, baby, you get good at throwing them rocks. You get good at playing that harp. You get good at tending to them sheep. You develop a heart for God. One 
one day God will put you right in the middle of your destiny. You will step into it and that will be behind you. We never see that David uses a slingshot again because he becomes the king of the nation. Come on somebody. Give God some praise in this house.